Welcome back. I'm Vijay Vaitiswaran. I'm the Global Energy and Climate Innovation Editor at The Economist. I'm here at uh, the Global Conference on Energy and AI, convened by the International Energy Agency in Paris, where I've had the pleasure of moderating a series of conversations with leaders from government, from industry, from technology, and civil society. Uh, as we're wrapping up our conversations today, I'm very pleased to welcome Laura Kotsi, who is the IES Director of Sustainability, Technology, and Outlooks, to give us a sense of what's happened and where we go next. Welcome, Laura. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vijay. So let's start um, by asking, how did the IEA uh, get involved with this uh, topic of AI and energy? Uh, and in a sense, uh, put your finger on the pulse of the hottest hottest topic around. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vijay. So we started working on energy and digital quite some years ago. Back in 2017, we started working on the interaction between, between the two. But um, really, at the beginning of this year, this uh, came to a very uh, different level. Basically, every energy, uh, every energy conference we were going to was really an energy and AI event. Uh, and looking at data, because this is very much what we do at the IEA, we look at data. Uh, we started noticing something. Uh, so advanced economies, electricity demand has remained flat basically for the past decade. Mm -hmm. But uh, early signs uh, of growth were starting to appear in the US, in Europe, in Japan. And we started digging further in data. And what we are seeing is actually that generative AI, which is a different type of AI that the one has been out there for quite some time, is actually increasing very fast and uh, s starting to uh, really helping electricity demand to start grow again. So uh, we started a new stream of work. Uh, the idea of this new stream of work will be to have the best data possible to understand current electricity use for AI, what is the outlook, right. and understanding not only energy needs for AI, but also what AI can do for the energy sector. Sure. Um, but just to give some perspective, um, and which is what uh, the World Energy Outlook and some of the other publications uh, do, is, is really look at the full system picture. It's right to say that AI, though it takes up 99% of mind space yeah. and, and maybe media space, is actually flipped. It may be hardly 1% of total energy consumption, right? That uh, even within the electrification trend, it may be other factors like the rise of uh, advanced manufacturing or EVs or, or air conditioning in poor countries are a much bigger trend. Is that fair to say? That's completely correct. So our data show that uh, uh, 2024, uh, electricity use for AI was about 1% of global electricity use. And when we look forward to 2030, well, it's not going to be the largest uh, reason of growth in global electricity demand. As you mentioned, we are seeing uh, cooling and other appliances growth in emerging economies uh, taking a much larger shares and electric vehicles in, uh, in advanced economies taking a much larger share. Having said this, uh, I think that there are in local places where you install the data centers that power these uh, uh, generative AI, then there, there is, is not the same story. It's like you are actually adding maybe a couple of aluminum smelters. So in places like Virginia or, or Ireland, you're talking about loads that is not 1%, but 20, 25%. So there is a global story, right. but then there is the local story that we need to look at as well. Right, and so specific uh, localities need to pay particular attention, um, and especially as the size of these, particularly AI-related data centers, uh, approach half a gigawatt or more, exactly. perhaps a gigawatt if you believe the predictions. Um, and the way that the load happens is not simply the quantum, but also uh, some of the fluctuations and temporality, I understand, presents a challenge to the grid. Absolutely. When the, when the models are learning, then you have a spikes in electricity use, uh, right. but then you're making your search, then the electricity use will be lower. So there is a variability in the demand that is also posing uh, potentially some challenges, but it could also be used for flexibility that is so much needed in the electricity sector. So we will need to look, certainly we are doing so in our forthcoming report at both sides of the story. Before we get to that, let's spend a minute on what happened here at this gathering. Absolutely. Now, uh, this brought together governmental leaders, but also, interestingly, both energy utility leaders and tech leaders from yeah. the big tech companies who are the big consumers of all of this, of course. And um, uh, there were some initial expectations of some challenging conversations, right? Is it fair to say? Uh, how did things work out in the end? So first of all, during this process of uh, starting to look at the AI and energy, what we understood is that there has not been really a global gathering bringing together the main voices from the tech sector to understand what do they need, the energy sector, what do they need, what the policymakers, what do they need, and this is what we really wanted to do today. So um, we had a really fascinating conversation 
and I would say that uh, it was very candid, a very, very candid discussion. And you will see uh, on our web website some of the principles that we have uh, uh, put forward, and uh, maybe I can just mention two or three of them. The sure. first, it's very, very clear that uh, there is not going to be AI without energy, and specifically electricity. So broad agreement, this is going to grow, and we need to work collaboratively to make sure that this is happening, and not that the energy sector becomes a break for um, AI to grow in a sustainable uh, in a sustainable way. Second, it was very clear that the dialogue today really improved unlocking some of the conversations. We heard uh, stories about and issues about uh, permitting that are similar for data centers and, uh, uh, and grids. So uh, some of these dialogues will really help uh, policymakers and both industries to move ahead in some of the uh, possible uh, blockage. The third point I would like to say uh, emerged very, very clearly. Uh, that data, data transparency, and uh, uh, the fact that a trusted source can make available this data is going to be critical for planning and to move ahead in this uh, uh, digital uh, energy uh, and climate transition. Uh, what I mean with this, I take 2024 as data point when we were collecting the numbers, we were ha having 1% of electricity, but using some other data so sources, 2%, which mm -hmm. is a factor 2 is not a minor uh, factor, yeah. so we really need to get together and understand uh, the, the needs. And there is, as you rightly say with your third point, uh, in the marketplace among Wall Street analysts and yeah. industry experts, uh, much higher numbers in terms of yeah. predictions that I've seen, um, yeah. sometimes even semi-credible sources uh, yeah. from Wall Street. Um, and uh, one explanation is that a lot of these hyperscaling companies may apply for permission to build in multiple jurisdictions yeah. when they only intend to build one or two. So yeah. they, because of the uncertainties involved yeah. in permitting and regulation Absolutely. and approval, they want to hedge their bets. They're placing chips on multiple numbers on the on the board. Uh, but uh, if we count all of them, that's not a true test of Absolutely. how big the demand would be. Right? There's uncertainties like this as well Absolutely. for legitimate reasons. They don't know, so they're risk, and, and you don't know as a data yeah. collector, right? So yeah. uh, is there a role right. for then uh, how do we break through this logjam? Yeah. Should data be man mandated or some sort of uh, government involvement? So there was a suggestion made up uh, today um, that there could be a creation of an observatory where the IEA as an unbiased uh, uh, place uh, mm -hmm. could be the place where some of the voluntary uh, submission of data could start, uh, uh, could start happening. There are some jurisdictions where um, obligatory uh, data submission will happen. However, there are some uh, some disclosure issues, competitiveness issues, that need right. to be taken into account. So there will be some work to be done to understand which type of aggregation of data uh, could be made possible, but certainly uh, we have taken up the idea that uh, we could become one of the observatories collecting those, um, those data going forward. I see, so that's very interesting. Uh, there is a methane observatory, for example, Absolutely. on emissions, which could, yeah, could be a template exactly. for this. Um, and that's related to demand. There are also challenges or questions put on the table about um, standards for uh, yep. efficiency of the data centers, yep. for example, and there seem to be multiple approaches. Yep. It's a very sort of anarchic process at the moment. Do yep. you see a role for some sort of, sort of convergence? And should it come in the form of regulation, as might happen in the European Union, or some bottom-up uh, industry consortium that's voluntarily achieved, as might happen in the U.S.? So standardization and the interoperability were discussed at length this afternoon, and we understand, so uh, sa um, France is hosting a major AI summit uh, in France uh, in February, and they will take up this, uh, uh, this very topic. Uh, clearly, there is not consensus in the room cr cr currently about what's the best way forward, but certainly subject to a point to that by many, many uh, of the participants today. Well, that's something to look forward to. So Absolutely. February of next year, and that's actually a nice point to finish on. Maybe you can uh, uh, land us on the question of what the next stream of work that will be related to uh, the IEA itself in this area. Yes, uh, so absolutely. We Today uh, we are coming out with the chess summary and the idea is that this work will continue and we are in a way passing the ball first to France and we will work with them for the AI summit. Um, and after that, very interestingly, uh, Canada, who hosting the G7, has also uh, pointed big interest to continue work in AI. And we will continue to work with the G7 uh, on that. In the meantime, uh, in spring uh, next year, we will launch uh, this uh, energy and AI and AI for energy report that will try to put the first data uh, and understanding on this complex topic. Great. So it's a fast-moving topic, but the IEA is 
also moving fast, it sounds like. Absolutely. And so I'm sure people who are interested will be following this very closely. Thank, thank you. Thank you Laura. very much. Thank you. And I want to thank you to our viewers for watching our series of live conversations from the first ever Global Conference on Energy and AI, which was hosted here by the IEA in Paris at its headquarters. I moderated several high-level conversations with government, business, and civil society participants, uh, including Google, Hitachi, Schneider Electric, Infosys, Kairos Power, and of course the IEA itself. These are um, uh, available as replays on the IEA's website. You can find them there. And they clearly highlighted both the challenges, which are considerable, as well as uh, the opportunities, which uh, are perhaps even more so, I would put to you. So stay tuned for more analysis from the IEA uh, in the year ahead, as described with the summit and more analysis to come with the report. Uh, and thank you again for joining us. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.